Last Friday, first quarter earnings season kicked off with three major banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. And then on Monday and Tuesday, we heard from Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America. These results came during a rocky period for the overall market, which is one reason nearly all the big bank stocks sold off hard. But some of them got hit a lot harder than others. More importantly, when you actually go through the quarters of the action, the banks just doesn't seem to reflect the quality of the numbers. J.P. Morgan got killed. City got killed. Bank of America got killed. Meanwhile, Wells Fargo, Goldman were flat, and Morgan Stanley was up in a decent amount over this three-day period. So tonight, I want to walk you through what we heard from the big banks, because these are some of the most important companies out there, and they give us a tremendous in- amount of insight into the rest of the economy. They often are predecessors to what's going to happen after. The insight only matters if you really know what happened, rather than just extrapolating from the tape, which is what most people do. So we're going to start with the four big money centers, and then we're going to go to the two major investment banks after the break. Yes, these are that important. Let's start with J.P. Morgan. Now, this is generally considered the best run, strongest bank in the country, even as the stock was hit the hardest. If that wasn't because uh, it wasn't, it, you got to understand this, it was not because the numbers were bad. J.P. Morgan delivered a top beat. Uh, bottom beat with 8% earnings growth. That's terrific. Average loans up 3% when you back out their acquisition of First Republic. Loans are up 16% when you include the First Republic numbers. And why not include them for heaven's sake? J.P. Morgan had extremely solid expense management, too. Their credit metrics mostly look good. In fact, this bank's provision for credit losses came in a nearly a billion dollars lower than expected, down 32% versus the previous quarter. That's sensational. Well, then you're probably asking, what the heck went wrong? Well, you could argue that J.P. Morgan's core net interest income, this is this NII thing, forecast for 2024 was only raised by a tiny amount. Wall Street was hoping for higher for longer rates would help them post bigger net interest margins, which many banks are having. Didn't help that Jamie Dimon, he was so cautious in his comments. But mainly, I think the stock had simply run too much in the quarter. It was up 15% year to date, 52% of the previous 12 months, right before the company reported. Hey, throw in the ugly market that day, and you had a recipe for a sell-off, even though the numbers were just fine. That said, the stock has reversed so hard at this point that it's lost a lot of its premium. You know what? That makes it a lot more attractive than when it reported. I was kind of thinking, hmm, maybe this is a good level. Slightly later on Friday morning, Wells Fargo reported this charitable trust name got the best response from the market. That day, with its stock down less than a half a percent, one point it was up nicely. Wells delivered a meaningful sales and earnings beat. Even as average loans were down 2% year over year, average deposits were down 1%. Those lines aren't as important for this bank, though, because it still has a Fed-mandated asset cap. Expense management was solid. Credit metrics, I thought, looked really good. How about the forecast? Wells Fargo maintained its full-year guidance for net interest income and net interest expenses, and management confirmed that they plan to buy back more stock in 2024 than they did last year. Well, talk about a vote of confidence. Overall, it was a solid, if unspectacular, quarter from Wells. But you know what? In the banking business, unspectacular is fine. We've owned Wells Fargo for the Travel Trust for more than three years, betting on a turnaround. The idea is that they're gradually getting better operationally and putting up clean quarters, and that will eventually cause the regulators to ease up, please, and allow the stock to earn a higher price earnings multiple. With that in mind, I think CEO Charlie Sharp and his team did exactly what they needed to do. This stock is still below where it was six years ago. Hey, that's compelling in itself because it's a much better bank now than it was then. Citigroup was on the fi- was, that was the final bank report on Friday, and the expectations were much lower here because Citi's been an extremely long-term underperformer. Fortunately, COJ and Fraser pushed through a big restructuring plan last year, so now we're looking at steady results. And you know what? That's what we got. Citi delivered a solid revenue beat and a substantial earnings beat, management reiterating both their full-year forecast and their longer-term targets. Hey, I'll take that. That's why the stock initially headed, uh, was heading higher on Friday morning for quickly reversing and then traded lower, especially during the conference call. City ended the day down 1.7%. And it was the second worst performer of the six major banks over the three days from Friday through yesterday. Disappointing. Why did this happen? Why did it reverse? City had some negative credit quality trends in the retail services business. You got to think consumer credit cards. Management warned that the division will continue to have higher than expected net, char- net credit losses through the current quarter and possibly the full year. I did not like that. They tried to frame these numbers from a post-pandemic return to normalcy, but the comments here really spooked a lot of people, including me. At the same time, I think there was a lot of profit taking in City because the stock had run from the high 30s last October to the low 60s earlier this month. Yep. 
As I said at the top, you got to be aware of these parabolic moves. People are betting on a turnaround, but they didn't know if the turnaround would work, so they look for any excuse to ring the register, and that's exactly what they did, honestly. It's the uh, responsible move, I think. Finally, Beckenmark reported yesterday morning, and this is a conundrum. I mean, Wall Street didn't like it. Stock falling 3.5% response. At one point, it was down 5%. Did it deserve to get punished? You know what? I'm, I'm going to position myself as being uh, on the fence. I hate being on the fence, but that's where I am. Bank of America's quarter was solid enough with a healthy revenue beat and decent earnings beat, positive. However, unlike the other money center banks, Bank of America's provision for credit losses was merely in line with expectations. With everybody else's number was actually smaller than expected. The company's seeing elevated write-offs in commercial loans, primarily because they have more exposure. Here we go to office real estate than any of the other big boys apart from Wells Fargo, which reported benign credit metrics. For what it's worth, managers said they expect lower losses from the office properties this quarter with a notable decline in the second half, but right now they have more exposure to the bad stuff than I thought. More importantly, at least for me, Bank of America said they'd expected their net interest income, that's at NII again, to fall in the first quarter, but actually grew. That's a positive. As we're talking about the core banking, manage, uh, banking business here, Management now says they expect their net interest income to fall in the second quarter, but quickly rebound from those lows. Bank of America was much more positive than the other big banks on the net, this net interest uh, margin front. In the end, though, there was a lot of trust us. Things will get better in the back half of the year. And that's hard for many investors to swallow, particularly with a bank. Now, if you believe Bank of America's management, you know what? I do, because I think they're very reliable then maybe this pullback is a buying opportunity. Then again, I cannot blame anyone for not wanting to stick their neck out on the bank stock in this tape. <laughs> Bottom line, if you want to take your cue from the bank stocks, keep in mind that the big money center banks reported mostly okay to decent numbers, even if that's not reflected in their stocks, which had run into earnings. Stick around, though, and we're going to go through two major investment banks that got a much better reception than the money centers, and that reception is not over. Mad Money is back after the break. Coming up, more major earnings from the big banks. Kramer's bankable take on the financials continues next. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. 